Okay, so welcome to the uh, uh, Strut Shifting Landscape. Uh, it's the fifth in the series. Uh, the theme today is the public accounting profession and COVID-19. And we will look more specifically to the change in the nature of work and implication for mental health. Uh, you have, I'll say, more information on, I'll say, the seminar itself, including uh, the bot the bio of each of the uh, panelists uh, on, on the website. So let's look at the, uh, I'll say the, the recognition of the, uh, the territory acknowledgement. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the sacred land on which the Strat School of Business and Carlton University operates. This land is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin nation. We express gratitude for the opportunity to create and cultivate meaningful relationship on this territory. I uh, also want to uh, just mention briefly, uh, the event is organized by the Sprout School of Business, as well as with the Professional Accounting Research Group. So for those interested to uh, look at, I'll say different uh, note uh, papers or uh, forthcoming seminars, you could go to the uh, Sprout website and look for the PARG. Uh, you will also find, I will say, uh, information on the teaching side, both the BCom program and the Master of Accounting program, leading to the CPA designation. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, so we have, I will say, uh, uh, very interesting uh, discussion coming up. We have, I will say, four uh, roundtable panelists. Uh, so we have Greg Bodhi, uh, Manager, Assurance and Adversary Services for GGFL. We have Michael Birch, uh, Managing Partner of Welsh uh, LLP. We have Christy Karskalen. Uh, she's the Canadian Managing Partner of Audit for KPMG. And we have Carol, uh, Carol Wilding, uh, which is President and CEO of CPA Ontario. So welcome to all of you. Uh, the uh, host of the, uh, I'll say the panel, will be uh, Meredith Bujaki uh, and myself. Uh, we're both, Francois Bois, so we're both uh, professor in the Sprout School of Business. So we'll link there to uh, Meredith. Thanks very much, Francois. That's much appreciated. And thank you, everybody, for joining us, our panelists, as well as those of you who are um, sitting out there listening. Much appreciated. Uh, really um, inspired by the interest that you have had uh, in this panel discussion. And what I am going to do is pose a number of questions to uh, our panelists. Uh, I'll give two panelists the opportunity to respond directly uh, to each one of the questions. And uh, when the panel uh, met uh, earlier in the week to discuss, we agreed that they are free to interrupt each other if they wanted to elaborate or add something as well. So we're really hoping for a good conversation uh, around the, uh, the issues here. So the first question, and I'm going to ask Greg if he would start us off, really is to you know, let us know how your firm has addressed some of the challenges that have arisen from COVID-19 in different aspects of practice. Uh, and you know, have you come up with some innovative practices that you might recommend to others? Uh, and I'll ask Greg specifically to start by looking at some of the implications for audit practice. Sure, thanks. So. A lot of things I'm going to talk about, um, you know, really come back, come down to um, leveraging technology, both ones that we already had in place, as well as new technologies, as well as intentional and thoughtful change management processes. So we all know the world changed on March 12th this year. Uh, one day we we're in the office and the next day we we're all working from home. So um, there's an enormous challenge just to start with in terms of, you know, getting our all of our staff at home, making sure that they have the resources in place to uh, work as seamlessly as possible with our clients to continue to deliver the client service that our clients come to expect of us. Um, so, you know, the first the first big challenge was in our tech group to basically organize very quickly uh, what technology needs. We 
um, needed to fill. So getting uh, technology home for us, uh, making sure that uh, you know our, our servers had the capacity for um, an enormous increase in our usage of our VPN. Um, and that all went very quickly. So then the next big challenge was basically rethinking all of the processes that we had in place that were very in-person based or very paper based. So, you know, we went from meeting with our staff every day, meeting with our clients every day, uh, dealing in paper, delivering financial statements in paper, um, to having to suddenly do this all remotely. So, um, you know, you go back to your to your team, your thoughtful and creative team, and get ideas from them, um, and then institute change as, as quickly and as thoughtfully as you can. Um, communicating with you know key stakeholders, uh, being you know your staff, your clients, um, and communicating the reason for the change, how it's going to impact them, um, how we're going to continue to deliver the service that that we um, or that they come to expect of us. Um, this all kind of happened around the start of tax season as well. Um, and we have, we have a lot of our clients that, you know, are, are happy to deliver information to us electronically, but, you know, a not insignificant uh, amount that are still uncomfortable with dealing with technology. So we had to figure out processes for getting um, paper information from them while keeping our team safe and and our, our clients safe, both themselves and our other clients. So uh, we came up with creative ideas for for um, gathering that kind of information securely and safely. So what our creative team came up with was um, basically repurposing shred bins uh, to to make them essentially secure drop boxes for our clients to come into our lobby during a specified time period, um, drop off their paper information. It would say quarantine for uh, the recommended period of time, and then our, our skeleton staff would uh, go in, uh, take the paper documents, and basically scan them and uh, send them off to our team to work on them uh, remotely. So, uh, you know, that was a very creative, creative process um, before we had, you know, the guidance about plexiglass and PPE and all that sort of thing. A big challenge of ours, um, or I should say, a big asset of, of GGFLs and something that keeps coming up in employee engagement surveys is, is our culture. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to maintain the culture that we all love so much. So um, we were talking earlier about a lot of that is created through, um, you know, organic interactions, going out to lunch with each other, bumping into each other, um, you know, at the coffee maker and all that sort of thing. We don't have that right now working from home. So um, we spent a lot of time coming up with creative ideas to continue to foster that, um, those social interactions and creating that corporate culture. So, um, you know, we, we started doing all staff meetings where I would say a minority portion of the meeting is spent on business and the rest is spent on just social interactions. So, uh, you know, leveraging technology like Zoom and creating breakout meetings to have you know, fun games and, and create those touch points um, with our staff. We also created, um, you know, increase the frequency of smaller departmental meetings. Um, and again, with those, it's, it's a minority amount of time spent on business and a majority amount of time spent on um, the social side and creating those, those interactions. Um, Maybe I'll circle I'll back. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Maybe I'll stop you there, Greg, and yeah. sort of see if I can ask Michael if he, he can add yeah. anything. And, and in particular, uh, I know Michael has headed up the tax area, so maybe he can build on some of your thoughts with respect to the challenges and the innovations um, from the tax practice side of things. Sure, uh, although I will say my tax is not quite as strong as it once was, but yes, I, I still am closely in touch with them and a member of the Ottawa tax group, so. I do know what they were going through from our perspective, and I could almost just say ditto to Greg, because we, you know, a lot of these things we've all faced and we're all moving through. For a ta from the tax perspective, a big uh, issue for us was the, these changing, shifting uh, deadlines and how we, you know, keep our staff engaged and how we move through these shifting deadlines, how we stay uh, productive when 
we have half the information, but the deadlines change, we get the rest of them. So that was a, you know, that's, that's been a balancing act that's been a little bit difficult. And then the second part of that is the stimulus packages that, that have been announced. So that sort of falls on our tax group to, um, to, to, to understand them and to get the information out to our clients about how best to uh, approach them, how best to apply, who they apply to, and, and, and how do they get repaid and all these other things. So it's, uh, those were the two sort of main things. And obviously that resulted in a, a completely different busy season, right? We had a, you know, historically we've had this busy season. We've been lucky. We put our shoulder to the stone and we worked through it. Now it's a busy season. That's, I would call it a busier season, not completely busy, but it's been extended and it keeps rolling out. And so now we're stuck with times when we're fully staffed. We have everyone in the office that we expect, well, not in our office in this case, but on hand, hands on deck, and the work's not there. So we had to, you know, be creative in saying, you know what, some of us have to take some holidays at this point. We know we need the break in any event because of the just the stress of it all. So let's take some holidays at times when we never would have before. We had to adjust the hours and actually shift the workload to different people too because of the way it was coming in. And then obviously we did, as Greg mentioned, we, we uh, enhanced our technology. We, we took advantage of electronic filing, which is permitted by CRA. We basically scanned every piece of paper that came into the office for uh, dissemination and storage. Uh, the remote training was tough. So first of all, we to come to grips with these new government plans. And then we got to make sure that our staff are aware of them and, and familiar with them and can discuss them with their, uh, with their clients. In the past, we would pull them all into one of our training rooms and we'd put on a webinar and, or a seminar and we'd go through it. We'd answer their questions. Now we're doing it all remotely, which is, is good, but it's not quite the same, at least not yet. I don't think the interaction's not quite the same yet. So, so that was a big part of it. Um, and uh, just getting these programs in place and being able to help our clients with them and, and apply for them all remotely. You know, my big thing for me is that how do we keep our staff connected to Welch? If they're all out working on the dining room table or in their offices, how do we keep them part of Welch? So we, we've had to work with that to make sure. And then what about our clients? If we're not in our clients face, if we're not interacting with our clients, if we're not touching them and feeling them and all the rest of it, what do we have to do to keep them on side as well? So that's sort of the changing landscape from our perspective. Thanks, Michael. I think that's a nice segue to the, the next question, which uh, I wanted to ask. And I'll ask Christy if she'd start us off on this one. Uh, how have you found that your own professional staff have been impacted by the, the pandemic? Um, and have you noticed that there are some groups or demographics of those staff that have been impacted more than others? Um, and then what kinds of uh, suggestions or solutions have you been able to come up with? Sure. Thanks, Meredith. And I would start off similar to uh, what Greg said. It just uh, amazes me the resilience of our people and the fact that they had to go to working remotely uh, overnight. Um, because before this happened, I don't think any of us would have thought we could have uh, we could have done that. Um, and so I think we have had to think very differently about how we collaborate, whether it be within teams or whether uh, it be with our clients, as Michael alluded to. So um, in some ways, um, we were lucky uh, when the pandemic hit us, the big, uh, big public companies, most of the work was done. Uh, but we did still need to get our arms around and deliver audits, reviews to uh, a huge portion of our business that hadn't uh, got it done by the end of March. So there was, uh, literally daily um, conversations on Zoom or Teams or whatever the, uh, the, the mode would be with our teams and with clients. Uh, all of a sudden you were getting evidence electronically. How did you know that it was, uh, it was real? Uh, some, some clients, and we'll deal with it now in the fourth quarter, how do you count inventory virtually? All of those things uh, our teams had to deal with. Um, we also had to deal with uh, our firm. We bring in a ton of summer students. Um, and so we had to uh, think about what the program looked like since it was now uh, uh, 
uh, virtual and no one was in the office. So we had to uh, uh, respond and I think a whole bunch of firms had to respond quickly and, and uh, redesign a program that uh, worked in a uh, virtual environment. Uh, Carol will talk about it, I'm sure, but the CFI had to happen virtually. So there's a whole bunch of things that needed to uh, to happen uh, overnight. And it just uh, always amazes me the resilience and how everyone has adapted so quickly to the environment. Um, in terms of uh, uh, mental health, I do think it's affected uh, different groups uh, differently. So you have a whole bunch of people working from home that have uh, young kids that have had uh, the longest March break ever. So you're trying to do your job and you have uh, uh, children running around uh, uh, needing supervision, needing attention. So that's really tough. Um, you have people that are living alone in often very small uh, apartments that uh, the feeling of isolation is, um, is, uh, is really tough. And so we've done different things. We've had a number of uh, mental health seminars uh, that deal with resilience, deal with stress, uh, managing anxiety, things like that to really help our, uh, our people and our families uh, cope. We really, um, I think Michael, as you said, tried to connect uh, with our people so that they don't feel like they are, uh, they're in it um, alone. So technology has been huge. And then we've had different uh, pop-up networks trying to support our people. So we have uh, created a working parents network and we actually over the summer had uh, some older children come in and well, come in virtually uh, uh, put on different sessions for, uh, for younger kids. And we've also had a, uh, a pop-up network um, for uh, people that are home alone and uh, uh, really allowing them to connect with each other, just as really trying to build uh, connections and remove the, uh, the feeling of isolation. Super, those are great suggestions and a really creative use of some teenagers who might otherwise been at home. Um, Too much you know. time on their hands. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Greg, I'm going to come back to you and, and definitely we'll get to Carol in a, in a couple of minutes. But I was going to ask you, because your firm's uh, smaller in size, the, the same question with respect to professional staff. And I think your answer had begun to touch on that uh, earlier. But have you noticed some that have been particularly impacted by this shift to uh, a virtual world and uh, you know have you come up with some creative solutions with respect to supporting people from the mental health standpoint yeah for sure so uh, like Kristen we have you know we have we're about 100 people to give a bit of context um, so we have our share of staff who are living alone in apartments uh, our share of staff were you know young young parents who are now doing two jobs um, you know, maybe they have high risk health members or maybe they're high risk themselves. Maybe they, their family members are working on the front lines in the hospitals. So um, we have, we have, we certainly have our, uh, you know, our benefits. We have our uh, EAP program and encourage anyone to use, use those resources because um, we have access to trained mental health professionals. Um, outside of that, it's just from our perspective, it's really about you know, checking in on, on all of our staff, because we all, we all know that they're in, uh, everyone has unique circumstances. So checking in on all of our staff and, and coming, coming at it with a, from the human perspective and just, you know, really just checking in on them personally, uh, showing empathy and understanding, um, being flexible when they need to make alternative work arrangements um, to deal with, uh, you know, whether, whatever priorities they have in their lives. Um, you know, Kristen talked about, uh, you know, onboarding staff. So um, that can be a really difficult thing because you have a, you have new staff coming on board that have never met anybody in person. So, you know, how do you integrate them and make them part of the team? So um, during our department meetings, um, we had a creative idea where um, you basically have kind of a know your employee series. So each week, um, a staff member from the department would um, you know, give a short presentation about themselves, you know, outside of work and it can be how, whatever length they want and whatever, de uh, you know, level of detail they want to get into. But at the end of uh, their presentation, 
they would choose the next person. So it really broke down kind of the hierarchical, um, you know, top down communication. It was really more about, you know, we're all, all part of a team and um, it's just about kind of fostering that, um, that teamwork, that team, team based mentality that we're all here to support each other um, and get through the difficult situations. Super. Thank you. Carol, I'm going to come to you now. Uh, and I know, you know, in addition to being an employer, CPA Ontario also, um, you know, sets the tone or you know, serves as a role model for many of the organizations within the public accounting sector and the accounting sector generally. So I'm going to ask you what kinds of resources or strategies uh, was CPA Ontario able to put in place to support your staff? Um, and anything that you found particularly helpful, you know, perhaps for yourself uh, as an individual as well. Sure. But maybe what I'll just first give you a little, before I jump into those, Meredy, is the, um, you know, when I listen to my colleagues here just talk about what are the impacts on your firms, is similarly as, as the regulator and as a professional member body, uh, you know, we had, we had some analogies in terms of what we needed to do. So for instance, taking our practice inspection had to go online, not completely different than, than you have to take an audit online. Our practice inspection team had to figure out just the copious amounts of paper, but how do you do a practice inspection online, which was interesting. And Christy, you alluded to the safety, and I have to say that, you know, that's something I'm just immensely proud of the profession and, and all of us collectively as a profession, certainly our team. We had 50 plus people in Ontario who led not just for Ontario, but across the country. We had almost 4,500 students in Ontario, right, in 45 hotels. And, um, it was incredible how the profession came together and partnered and the firms came in, we needed volunteers to proctor because we had to completely pivot and deliver an exam in a very, very different way. And so it's, a, and it's an example of resilience and innovation and many people don't always look to the accounting profession for that, but I will tell you that, um, that it's a model there that, uh, that we did extremely well on. So I'm just really proud of how the profession responded to that. Um, look, in terms of, say on the employee and our staff, we're, we're a pretty small team. Um, I think they punch above their weight, but we're some 300 people our team is um, in Ontario. And there was really two core areas. So one, and I think both areas, you know, people have spoken to here, but one was around getting people very quickly to work remotely and what we needed to do there. And then the second, more importantly, was about the well-being of our employees. And I'll say mentally and physically, you know, that well, that well-being. And we did a lot on that front. On the work remote, you know, our technology team are heroes, like they are, I think, across companies, and the ability to pretty much pivot overnight, which we did, and we were able to do, um, to do that. But then virtual onboarding, you know, we had some people starting brand new and literally started in a virtual setting. It's a very, very different experience to get them in and, and help them to feel connected. So a lot of work there to support employees in the work remote. You know, we, we moved some big monitors home. We tried to get people to use their healthy uh, lifestyle allowance that we try to provide to say, do I need a proper chair? You know, what do I need? How do we make it a little bit easier to work remote? On the, um, on the well-being side, we put tremendous amount of, of energy and effort and continue to do so. And so on that front, I will say the big piece was on, on mental health. So we increased our benefit um, and the number of practitioners and the coverage there so that our employees could just have access to more resources. We put in a new program um, that, that was from the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association. It's called Not Myself Today. So it was a program we were going to go forward with, but we really brought it in and, and had to execute it in a virtual way. So people typically would might wear a badge that, you know, you talk about how you're feeling that particular day, and obviously, hence the, the title of the program, Not Myself Today. So how did we create that openness that it's okay to actually acknowledge in front of your colleagues that I'm having a tough day and it can be different things for different people. So we, we put that in, in there. We also, as a senior team, talked a lot about how do we try to create a sight line into looking at our at-risk employees. And at-risk can mean, um, you know, certain physical limitations, but at risk can mean, you know, the emotional stress of, of, we've heard references here to I have young children or I have elderly parents I'm caring And how did we make sure that all of our people managers were trying in some way to have a little bit of visibility into that? And, um, and we continue to work on that front. 
we, um, we did a lot on virtual town halls um, and we brought in a variety of speakers. So we had a sleep expert come in to talk about sleep because a lot of people weren't sleeping. And um, I can certainly speak to that one. And you know, I know I had a few nights there where just was very restless and didn't really understand my restlessness. I couldn't kind of get a handle on it, but you know, you know, sleep hygiene, they talk about it a lot, but it's always good to reacquaint yourself with that. Cause if you don't get a great sleep, it, it just, everything kind of goes from there. So we did a lot of that. We did, um, we did the stress and anxiety pieces. We timed some such that when uh, kids were going back to school in the fall, we had sort of an anxiety management program that we put in place. Cause a lot of parents are feeling very anxious about putting their kids back into the school system. Um, and then we did a lot to create, you know, more of that community because as much as, as everybody is experiencing it in their own way, we really wanted to find ways to create community because I think helping others always makes you, you know, feel better as much as giving is about giving to others. It's also giving is about helping yourself. So we did things around um, community food center drives that we did. We, we had a number of charitable initiatives. And another one that the profession did that I'm sure many people participated in that we felt really proud of is we very quickly mobilized the Accounting for Bravery program. And, and I have to tell you, the stories I continue to hear are just incredible of, you know, fr from all of you, Michael, Gray, Christy, your organizations that participated and, and our frontline members and CPAs who were there to uh, do tax returns for our frontline healthcare workers and for their families. And when you wanna talk about a profession that tends to be risk averse and managing risk and looking at it all the time, and then we asked our members to say, hey, can we put our arms around these frontline healthcare workers and do something that's unique to us as a profession and give back? And, and everybody put their hand up really quickly and worked through all the potential challenges of what that could be. And we did it paperless. All of our partners here and others did it paperless. And for over 4,000 um, healthcare workers and their families, we were able to, to uh, provide their tax returns. So there's a bit of a window into there into some of the things that, that we did. And I guess like others, we, you know, on, for our employees, we did something called, it's called the Daily Fix, where you can go in. It's a virtual online cafe for our employees so they can connect and, and whether it's the foodies sharing their recipes or it's the gardening or it's whatever, it's part of Michael, your comment, you know, how do you keep your culture? How do you create some sticky points to try to keep people staying kind of connected to each other? Um, and then I think probably the biggest personal reflection for me is, you know, I, I, I immediately talked to, you know, my comms team and my head of comms, Tara, who's pretty spectacular and said, look, I really, I need to, I need to talk to the employees on an ongoing basis. How do I literally virtually put my arms around 300 people and say, you're going to be okay. I don't know what tomorrow brings, but you're going to be okay. And so we put a communication plan in place. Initially, it was pretty much every day, and then it was down to three times a week. Now it's down to once a week. But I asked people to, um, the tonality but was a very, very important. I think we got it right. But I asked them to tell me, how are you feeling? What's on your mind? What, are, what can we do differently? What's working? What's not? And, and, you know, that can be a pretty tough thing for employees to feel comfortable, to be vulnerable back to a CEO and say, this is how I'm feeling. And so the, the piece that I feel very good about is that so many people opened up and shared with me a lot of personal reflection of what was going on in their families and the challenges for them and some of the good stories. The other side of it was, as I would think about it, I'd go, wow, it took something like this for me in some ways, I'm in a virtual world, I actually feel closer and more connected to many of my employees than I did before. And I would say, part of me says, hmm, did I need to, did I need to learn that lesson through this kind of a crisis? How, how come I wasn't more connected in some ways to some of my team? Not that I wasn't, but in some ways this actually helped me connect more. And then in other ways, I'm grateful that, that beyond the barriers of technology, that human connection found a way to happen. And so how do you continue to foster that? Because that's critical to, to the mental well-being for people to just say, it's okay that I'm gonna have a good day, a bad day, and, and we're kind of all in this together. We're all gonna kind of find our way in it. So those are some of my reflections and my experience. Super.
Thank you. There's some really great suggestions there that other organizations uh, might like to embrace. Michael, I, I'm going to ask you, um, same question, sure. any resources or strategies that have been put in place to support staff? Uh, and uh, if you would be comfortable, you know, a bit of a personal reflection as to what do you do in order sure. to support your own wellness? Yep. You know, the, and it gets back to a bit of what Carol was speaking about. What we realized right out of the gate was that most people already have challenges in their lives. And it, 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 it's a shame that we weren't maybe paying closer attention to it all along. I just assumed that, you know, we're all in this together. But now it's obvious that, that if we just have a, a whole new baseline now. Maybe our anxiety level used to be here for life. Now it's just gone to here. So when you start stacking things up on that, it has a far more detrimental effect than it did before. And so from a, an employer's perspective, we, we just absolutely have to be way more human. We need to be way more connected and we need to get our managers and our HR people and our partners trained into recognizing and to being you know, a bit more honest with themselves and that in turn might bring it out from our staff as well. You know, If we show oh, what this is doing to us, then they'll feel safer with their discussions mm -hmm. with us. Um, mm -hmm. We have, uh, we're planning a, a, a seminar, which I think is called Mental Health First Aid, which we're going to kick mm -hmm. off for all our, our managers uh, and people that are supervising later this month. Uh, we're emphasizing the need for self-care. You know, we're telling people, you, you better put your oxygen mask on first before you start helping everybody okay. else. So don't get lost in everybody else's issues, make sure you look after yourself and then you'll be better prepared to help others. So we're doing things like that. I mean, you know, it's easy for us to assume we've got a young workforce and so what could possibly be their problems, but just imagine, I mean, I, I think back when I was just sort of got my CA or just was working on it, if this would have hit, I would have been dumbfounded by how am I going to survive in all of this? How is, as like, is our firm going to be here 10 years from now? Like, well, what, what's going to happen with all this? So we really got to, you know, tell them, look, we got a handle on this. We're, we're, we're pushing through this. And in fact, out there, there is some, there's some good news. It's not all bad news. Uh, it's my understanding that maybe 90, 92% of the economy is booming and is moving pretty good. It's just the, the ones that are hurt are just hurt so desperately. So we need to, Make sure our staff know that we've got a mix of clients, but we also have a, an economy that's that's moving along. So, uh, you know, just trying to let them know that there's there's strength here. That we're looking at, like, we do our town halls, and we indicate every time that our management committee is looking very closely at the at the business side of our our practice. We've all sort of talked about the the skills that we perform for our clients, but we are businesses, and we are looking at our business. We are protecting our business. Um, uh, we're kind of lucky we've been around for 102 years. So we saw a pandemic once before. We've seen a couple of world wars. We've been through a few recessions and we feel comfortable that we'll weather it. So I think that's been helpful for our staff. Um, the self-care aspect, personally, I, it's, it's, to me, it's, I, I rely heavily on, on exercise. So I continue to try to make sure although it is not as, as, as fluid as it once was, but I try to make sure that I get out to the gym or, or we have a gym in the basement. So get down in the gym, work off some stress, uh, long walks, keep my running going. I just, I tried to finish a virtual race across Tennessee, but I ended up like uh, 65 kilometers short before the finish line, but it was still 930 something kilometers that I did. So just things like that, that keep you sort of focused. And then, routine too. I mean, it's so easy when you just walk down the hall to the den that, that you, you know, you don't maintain a good routine and routines are important in our lives. Routine about when we eat, when we sleep, when we exercise, you know, when do I take the dog out? That, so I just, just try to keep those things in line and, and try, you know, every chance I get just to ask our staff, Hey, how's it going? What are you facing? What can we help you with? Super. Thank you. Those are, are yep. great suggestions. And, you know, the, the physical and the mental health are absolutely connected. So, you know, you're quite correct to say maintaining that exercise routine is one important way of trying to reduce the stress. Mm -hmm. so. And also the two bottles of wine. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Everything in moderation, I think, is what okay, they yes. recommend. Uh, oh, I meant two glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Greg, I'm going to come back to you. Um, 
uh, I'll come back to you in a minute if I can. Christy, I, I'm going to come back to you uh, to ask you sort of the big picture question as to what do you think the future holds for the public accounting profession, both the short term, uh, and Michael's given us some indication of uh, some of the things he's, that um, Welsh is doing to make sure the business is healthy, but also in the longer term. So um, I think short term we deal with uh, and I alluded to a little bit in my earlier question, in the short term, we deal with questions about how we are going to count inventory virtually, how we are going to, we have a whole bunch of new people starting uh, this month. How are we going to effectively supervise and review uh, their work, get them up to speed? So things like that uh, are challenges that we need to adapt to and, uh, and use technology to make that uh, happen. I think what this will uh, force us to do in the longer term is to digitize uh, how we uh, perform our audits and reviews. So I think technology will become um, an even bigger piece of how we execute on a day-to-day -day basis. And so with that as well, there will be a, um, a need to upskill our people uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting them comfortable with different technology, using technology, um, whether it's robotic process uh, automation, things like that to digitize audit procedures, digitize tax, things like that. I think that's what uh, uh, the longer term holds for us. It's a huge opportunity to provide insights as well. So. Well, and, you know, with respect to upskilling staff, you know, I am quite sure that that will have some impact for those of us that are in academia, in terms of what are some of the things that you'll be expecting us in the future to try to make sure that new entrants to the profession have as well. So, yeah. Carol, can I ask you as uh, CEO of CPA Ontario to answer that same big picture question with respect to what you think the future holds for the profession? Mm. I would say that what, what COVID's done is, is accelerated our strategy in terms of looking at the future of the profession. I don't think it's fundamentally changed it, but it's really brought it forward. So there's things that we need to look at, at sooner and faster. And I'd, I'll look at that from both what I'll say a pre-certification and a post-certification. Okay. And so on the pre-certification side, you know, in, in terms of the journey to become a CPA and to get your designation, you know, you use the CPA as an example. I mean, incredible work that we did to actually turn a face-to-face -face experience into a different kind to make it happen. But technology is now so interwoven into learning that, that you know, one is, is not inseparable from the other. And we now need to move just that much more in terms of an online learning continuum for the pre-certification journey. And we, we, we as a profession are looking at, at that and there's some things that we're doing um, but we're going to have to move a lot faster on that front. I'd say even more importantly than that, because that's an enabler of it, is when you look at the competencies of a CPA. We've, we've had a lot of discussion and, um, and discussions with the firms around what are the skill sets that we need in the CPA. And was it ambulance by, sorry, a bit of a rebaselining um, around what, what the fundamental skills are. And I think we're going to need to move through that faster. I think it's an exciting time to come in because we actually want to put more of the data analytics skills, more of the technology or emerging technology skills, you know, your reference to RPA. And we're going to have to say some of the things that perhaps some of us learn traditionally and were tested on are really not the core competencies that we need to be putting in place in terms of an assessment in the, in the earlier days of, of coming into a CPA that they are just going to be, become more the rote task. So that work, redefinition of the competency map and rebaselining a CPA needs to move um, a lot faster. And then on the post-certification side, I think that, you know, we already look at that when we look at early stage, mid-career and late career CPAs. We do a lot of professional development, but we're having a, um, a lot of discussions with a number of our PSA partners, with a number of firms around micro-credentialing and the fact that you know, you just, you need to learn on the job. You need to learn in the experience and that you're never going to just be once and done when you get your CPA. Yes, we have CPD requirements, but beyond your CPD requirement, there just is a need to be getting certain skills. And I think some of the large firms, we've seen them do some interesting things in this regard. And we're saying as a profession, we need to move into that. 
So we're actually, we've got, a, a, I'll, I'll say a couple, you know, proof of concept ideas that we're working on that we're going to put out to the market pretty quickly. And how do we make sure that we are a supporter for our members, depending on where they are in that stage of their career, to help them um, in, in that process of that constant ongoing learning that, that, uh, that needs to happen if you're going to stay current to uh, whatever way you're practicing as a CPA. So those would be a couple of examples of, um, of how I think we need to change in terms of future of the profession relative to future of work. Yeah, I, I, I might, I'd like to add a few things. I really think the, um, the nature of our profession, certainly at, at the firm level of our size and our client mix is really broadening the service offering that we're providing to our clients. And it's, it, the technology has made this all possible, but I find more and more we're, we're, we're leaning in on business valuation transactions, M&A transactions. Now we're talking about, you know, supporting our clients through financial planning, supporting the shareholder as opposed to just the company, uh, wealth management. So I think as, as there's a sort of a convergence of the things and, and it's, it's most, most things I read say that the, the accountant is the most trusted advisor or certainly one of the most mm -hmm. trusted advisors. And it's important that, that we have the skill set to meet that sort of expectation of our clients that we can be there with the right answers to the right questions beyond, yeah, here's your statements, here's your tax liability, here's the planning we did to get it down. There's just so much more now that we can provide and technology backing us up. I think Christy talked about data analytics, all of that stuff is just gonna make it so much easier for us to be really integral to our clients' businesses. Super. So maybe I'll you know, ask Greg to pick up on this and uh, thinking about what you've just said, Michael, you know, how does that all impact what kind of advice you might give to a student or a new graduate who's just entering into uh, or considering a career in the accounting profession? I think there's a huge opportunity for students entering the accounting profession, uh, particularly new graduates. Um, you know, it's going to come with challenges in terms of, you know, as we've all talked about, how do we, how do we onboard new, new graduates, train them, uh, make them feel part of the team. Um, but, you know, these new graduates are, are people who are more likely the most tech literate in our, in our firms and um, may have the best ideas for us going forward in terms of, you know, new ways of doing things, new applications, new technologies. Um, so from my opinion, it's, it, there's a huge opportunity for students to impact, um, the workplaces that they're going to, um, in a positive direction. Um, and it's, you know, from employers, it's, it's our job to, you know, foster, um, a culture and communication where they feel comfortable, um, you know, raising the, those ideas and it may not be fully fleshed out, but, you know, um, making them comfortable that, you know, we're listening, we're listening to you. Tell us, tell us the way the world is going and, and uh, you know, how can, we, how can we move with it or move ahead of it? Super. Anybody else want to you know, say, you know, have you got uh, young people in your life perhaps that are saying, you know, what's, it, what's being an accountant all about? And Maybe I'll, I'll just uh, jump in. So I, I agree with Greg. I think there is still huge opportunity. I think there's also, um, there can also be more flexibility. Um, and it's important, as Michael said, to set routines and to set boundaries because you can find yourself sitting in front of your computer all day. But there's also a lot more um, opportunity for flexibility and to work your own way. Um, and so I think that is appealing for our, uh, for our people if we can give them permission to do so. Super. Yeah, uh, a, a general question. So anybody you know, could uh, could answer this, and then we've got a couple that have come in through the Q and A. So after this one, we'll turn to those. Um, we've talked about the staff perspective. We talked about the business perspective. We've talked about uh, CPA Ontario and what they're doing. We haven't touched a whole lot on the client perspective. So. 
you know, what changes, if any, have you noted in terms of the client's expectations uh, since we moved um, uh, into a, a virtual uh, approach to doing business? And how has that then had to impact what you are doing um, within your own organizations in order to either change or modify, um, you know, add to your delivery offerings? And I think we might have had a few hints on this, but, you know, that client piece that we haven't had a chance to really speak about yet. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> Michael? So from, yeah, sure. I'd like to, kick. I mean, as I said, we're a firm that's a hundred years old. So what the difficult part for us, I think has been bringing along some of our older clients into this world of technology and having them be comfortable with how they're receiving their information now and how we interact with them. So that's been a bit of a challenge and, and it's, it, it, when you talk about a younger individual that's perhaps providing the service and they're trying to provide it in a format that's now current and the recipient is, so we really have to manage that and we try to stay on top of that and educate our clients in that regard. So that's a bit of a, that's going to be a bit of a sticking point for a little while moving forward until everybody gets up to speed with these new technologies, I think. Yeah. I was helping my mother renew her GICs uh, virtually earlier this week, which was something she was not keen on at all, um, you know, but with some good coaching and, uh, and a bit of support, you know, we got the job done. So that's good. Yeah. Other, other observations in terms of client expectations and how they're changing? So Meredith, it's Christy. I would just add, it's, I find it interesting because our clients have had to move to a virtual environment as well. So they, the same kind of learning curve that all of uh, us have been on, they have yes. been on as well. And so I see us collaborating differently with our clients as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll have these types of meetings every day as you're working yeah. through an audit or a big project, something like that. Uh, I think what we have to uh, remember is we need to build our relationships with our uh, clients differently and uh, it's harder and you just have to force yourself to uh, to have a virtual coffee chat or something like that to keep the uh, the communications open but but they're going through the same journey in their business as we are uh, in our profession. Yeah and I, I think the other thing is I think they're becoming less and less interested in paying for compliance. You know, they're realizing that, <clears throat> come on, I, 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 there's gotta be an, a, a, an app or, or a software program out there that can reduce these compliance costs. And what I really, I mean, I'm happy to pay you your fee, but I want ideas from your fees. I want you to help my business. I want you to grow my business. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we really, in the back to data analytics, back to having the information that we can properly digest and provide real good guidance. I think that's going to be key. Thank yeah, you. I would double down on that one, Michael. It's about you know, being business enablers and, and how do we as CPAs in our profession, I mean, the table stakes compliance, it has to be there. It's critical to the entire yeah. and financial markets, but, but being those business advisors, advisors or business enablers, more so as we find our way through a very different kind of recovery period that's in front of us. I just, I think the CPA skill is in, is in high demand for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing in the US a lot of um, US public accounting firms are dropping the accounting and just sticking in advisory. They're just, um, they're no longer floating that they are accounting firms. They're saying we are advisory firms. And mm. that accounting's just oh. a small piece of it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Which uh, is great for people coming into the profession because it's opening up all these new opportunities. It's, it's, uh, it's super. But it so raises some students, questions as to what I should be, <laughs> raises questions as to what I should be teaching in my classes then if that's yeah, the case. So. Absolutely. Well, I think you'll always need your baseline, but yeah, yeah. I think there are far more things that we can uh, so. get involved with now. Yeah. I, I've got a couple of questions that maybe you could uh, touch on that are in the, the Q&A for some of the participants that are here. Uh, any thoughts on the upcoming holiday season? And for many of the firms, you know, the holiday party uh, has been a really big, important part of firm culture. Any other suggestions that uh, have come up or that you're thinking of that might replace that kind of a, a celebratory event for the firms? So I don't mind starting. Uh, I think it'll be different because I, I don't, assuming we are still in uh, 
the second wave that we are now, I think many of us will be uh, um, somewhat locked down. But um, with smaller groups, it works to have virtual dinner parties. So uh, send a, a meal to uh, your people's house and then get online and eat dinner together or something. So you, you just got to be creative. Um, it might not be in person, but I think you can still you can still connect. Yeah, so we're similar to that. We, we, we're planning uh, an alumni client event in December that will be virtual. We are going to send out uh, <clears throat> a bottle of wine and some cheese and crackers to the first 50 that sign up. We're going to ask the rest of them to buy the wine and cheese, which we will donate the money to the Ottawa Regional Cancer Foundation. Ah. Um, we're going to have this larger Zoom event, and then we're going to break out into rooms of decades. So depending on when okay. you're with the firm, move into that decade room and chat about your time, mingle with some of your friends. And I think something tells me we have some special artists coming in to do a virtual concert throughout the evening as well. Super, great suggestions. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think they're similar. One, the, you know, how do you do the food, have the meal, they put it to the home and get together. And the one other thing we found is that when you do do it in a virtual, I think we're getting, getting better at it but there's still this little awkwardness of you know who talks when or how do you talk because you can't have you know Kirsten and I can't be having a conversation and whatever Meredith and Michael having a conversation so yeah. in our CFI celebration when we brought our team together because they pretty much worked night and day for months we did um, we did bingo and it was all based on on questions and experiences around what had happened and it was just, it was so much fun and, you know, the employees loved it and it was a way for people to just, you know, let their hair down and have a bit of fun as well, you know, have a drink and a meal. So we're also trying to find other ways to add things like that in. How do you, how do you put some kind of activity together when you're trying to also create that, that connection? And so it's pushing us to be a little more creative that way, but there's lots of ideas out there <coughs> companies yeah. are doing. Yeah, once you start thinking about it, stuff flows. Yeah. So, yeah, no, creative, uh, creative ideas. Uh, I've got one other question. There were a couple of comments, more than questions, but there's one other question, um, you know, directed at Christy, but I'll let anybody answer. Uh, and I think we've heard some, uh, some sense of this already, but do you think that the pandemic could result in some of the accountant's role being replaced by technology and perhaps the loss of uh, jobs for our, our traditional accountants? So uh, I think my long and short, my short answer is no. So I, well, maybe it depends. So I think that some of the more uh, routine tasks will be replaced by technology. But in the longer term, um, that's probably a good thing. And as I said, I think the uh, um, interpreting the uh, data and turning the data into insights and value add, as we spoke about, will uh, always be there. And so what we need of our people um, uh, may evolve a little bit, but it will be better work for everyone. Yeah, I concur. Certainly more interesting work. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I think I'm going to leave our conversation there. I'm just looking at the time here and I've got a couple of minutes just to say some thank yous. Alison, I wonder if you could share those slides again. If you could. So uh, thank you, everybody. This is a, you know, a topic that's near and dear to both uh, Francois and to me in terms of looking at it. Uh, I'm really heartened to hear some of the great suggestions around promoting uh, wellness and mental health that have come up uh, in terms of your suggestions. I am involved with a research project that is on uh, healthy professional work and the accounting profession is one of the groups that's there. And we will be ready to launch a bit later this fall a a major survey of accountants with respect to mental health. And so, um, you know, that's certainly something that you are, could be thinking about if um, anybody's interested in participating. You could actually sign up at the website now for an interview if you wanted to go even more in depth than, than just uh, a survey in terms of participating. Uh, and we've been working on this for a couple of years now, and there is nothing that we can find, certainly in the academic literature, that uh, has looked at mental health 
help amongst accountants. So to me, it's a, a really important topic. And I think um, that has been really brought to light today um, through the, you know, the last seven or eight months. Uh, and I think it's going to continue to be important going forward. Um, if you're interested in other events uh, happening uh, at Carleton through the Professional Accounting Research Group, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, and then if we look, I did put together a couple of different kinds of resources. So I know a number of people who had registered had very broad questions that they would have liked to address that really fell in terms of uh, specific different types of um, technology advice or advice with respect to uh, you know, human resource or workforce issues or how to be more efficient, uh, which really was not the focus of this talk today. But I did include a number of links there. So CPA Ontario has some really great resources um, that are targeted at COVID-19. But when you get in there, you realize there's a whole lot more stuff than you might uh, first think. Um, I know Carol had uh, spoken to lots of um, chief financial officers uh, and coming up with five top lessons from the pandemic. So that's a really interesting read for those that you are interested. Uh, for people that uh, are looking for some specific advice, uh, certainly uh, with respect to CPA Ontario's member benefits, there are professional advisory services available that could uh, help address some of the more technical or the uh, HR kinds of issues. And then I actually sat in on a CPA Canada um, through the Financial Literacy Group. They were including in there a web webinar on mental health. So there's a number of really interesting resources that get at some of those more technical issues. Uh, and then on the mental health side, there is, uh, as uh, Carol was saying, the Canadian Mental Health Association, they've got some really great resources uh, that can be looked at. And one that I know has been promoted quite a bit. Uh, and some of you might have read the article in Pivot where uh, Denis Trache was, um, was interviewed. Uh, and I know he has actually referred many of his employees to this uh, workplace strategies for mental health and uh, particularly embedded in there what's called the plan for resilience where you can actually get in and work through the workbook for yourself to really try to come up with some practical strategies for individuals as to how to foster resilience. So hopefully those will be uh, of some benefit to you. And then my last task today really is to say thank you. Uh, thank you to Greg to Christy, to Michael, for Carol for making yourself available. I was saying as we got started, in some ways it's possible to do this. Uh, because we are virtual, it would be much more difficult to, uh, to have Carol join us in Ottawa in order to be able to participate. So, so thank you for all of your insights and your time today. Uh, thank you, CPA Ontario, for helping to promote the event. I think we've got a great turnout in terms of looking at it. Uh, and uh, to Kim and to Alison, who've been behind the scenes in particular uh, from the Sprott side, uh, making sure the technology worked so that I did not have to, uh, to be concerned about that. And then to all of those of you who've actually uh, been online with us, uh, thank you very much for spending an hour with us today. And I hope that you've gotten some really interesting insights and some good creative innovative uh, solutions and suggestions to take away. So thank you everybody. Wonderful to see you and uh, I'll look forward to touching base in the future. Bye for now. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.